Hello everyone and welcome back. Today I'm going to be teaching Disabled by Wilfred Owen. So first of all, let's just have a look at some background to the poem. Disabled was drafted at Craig Lockhart in October 1917, just like Doctrine et Decorum Est, which we looked at last week, and was revised in Scarborough in July 1918. Now Disabled echoes A.E. Hausman's poem to an athlete dying young. I know one uses this poem to criticise Hausman's patriotic enthusiasm for war and all poetry that made light of disablement and glorified death. And here you can always look back at Dolce et Coromest that we looked at last week, where we see Owen attacking the jingoists who portray war as um, quite trivialising and easy and as though it's a game to be quickly played and then recovered from. So if we just look at stanza one from an athlete dying young, you'll see the kind of um, tone and tenor that we're dealing with. The time you won your time the race, we chaired you through the marketplace. Man and boy stood cheering by, and home we brought you, shoulder high. And this is very much echoed when you see the young man in Disabled, who was also carried shoulder high and is victorious, having won a football match and been rendered man of the match. Now, Disabled was one of Owen's first poems to impress his soldier poet friends, and Robert Graves wrote to him declaring, Do you know, Owen? That's a damn fine poem of yours. Really damn fine. Owen, you have seen things. You are a poet. And that was really important to Wilfred Owen in that he already had the praise of Siegfried Sassoon. And again, if you want to know more about that relationship, you can look back at the Dolce et Decorum Est video. Um, but it did obviously uh, encourage Owen to feel that his, poet, his poetry was really developing and growing. And more importantly, the poem takes a deep psychological view of the deforming nature of war, expanding into a psychological study of destroyed humanity. And again, that's very important in that Owen zooms in and follows the journey of a particular soldier when so many of his poems explore the soldiers at large. OK, so let's have a quick overview then of the poem. So Disabled is the story of a young soldier who enlists in war for all the wrong reasons. And when we see him a mere year later, he has lost not only both his legs and an arm, but also his youth, his independence, his masculinity, his sexual attractiveness, and perhaps more importantly, his sense of self. Now, what's interesting about this poem is that Owen does not just gloss over the fact that the young soldier has in fact behaved really unwisely and in part instigated his predicament by behaving in a way that was so impulsive and, and foolish. But by the end of the poem, the sense of despair is absolutely overpowering, and we see Owen is unable to withhold his own or the reader's compassion for this devastated young man. So the key themes in the poem then are firstly the brutality of war and the lasting physical damage caused. And that's interesting in that we'll look later on at mental cases which is a poem focusing particularly on the mental and psychological damage caused by war. But this one, of course, is very much about the physical damage and the underlying psych psychological injury that if is resulted from that. Another theme is sympathy, pity and respect for the disabled soldier, as well as an implied criticism. And I've already mentioned that in that the soldier, Owen suggests, is not blameless in enlisting for war. Um, below the legal age of consent. There's also a key theme of bitterness towards the way disabled soldiers are treated when they return home by government and by civilians and also by women. This poem very much criticises women who desexualize this particular soldier and others like him and offer only pity and disgust. So in terms of structure then, this poem is one of the longer ones in the collection and Owen structures this poem using contrast between the soldier's present and past situation and indeed offers a glimpse into his future life. The poem consists of six stanzas of varying lengths and Owen zooms in on the ruined man, creating a relationship based on pity. And again, that's something we'll look at towards the end of the poem where some critics are um, fairly judgmental here and see that Owen has perhaps himself um, pigeonholed the disabled veteran and suggested that he is nothing beyond his disability. But that's something that we'll come on to as we work our way through the poem. 
So let's listen to it first then. It's a long poem, so it's over two slides. Disabled by Wilfred Owen. He sat in a wheeled chair waiting for dark and shivered in his ghastly suit of grey, legless, sewn short at elbow. Through the park voices of boys rang saddening like a hymn, voices of play and pleasure after day, till gathering sleep had mothered them from him. About this time town used to swing so gay when glow lamps budded in the light blue trees and girls glanced lovelier as the air grew dim in the old times before he threw away his knees. Now he will never feel again how slim girls' waists are or how warm their subtle hands. All of them touch him like some queer disease. There was an artist, silly for his face, for it was younger than his youth last year. Now he is old, his back will never brace. He's lost his colour very far from here, poured it down shell holes till the veins ran dry, and half his lifetime lapsed in the hot race, and leap of purple spurted from his thigh. One time he liked a blood smear down his leg, after the matches carried shoulder high, it was after football when he'd drunk a peg he thought he'd better join. He wonders why. Someone had said he'd look a god in kilts, that's why. And maybe too to please his Meg. Aye, that was it, to please the giddy jilts. He asked to join, he didn't have to beg. Smiling, they wrote his lie, aged nineteen years. Germans he scarcely thought of. All their guilt and Austria's did not move him, and no fears of fear came yet. He thought of jewelled hilts, of daggers in plaid socks, of smart salutes and care of arms and leave and payeries, esprit de corps and hints for young recruits. And soon he was drafted out with drums and cheers. Some cheered him home, but not as crowds cheered goal. Only a solemn man, who brought him fruits thanked him and then inquired about his soul now he will spend a few sick years in institutes and do what things the rules consider wise and take whatever pity they may dole tonight he noticed how the women's eyes passed from him to the strong men that were whole how cold and late it is why don't they come and put him to bed why don't they come So let's have a look at stanza one then. Uh, first of all comes a description of the disabled soldier in his wheelchair and he's tortured by the sounds of playing outside. So something that's interesting about this stanza is how Owen uses language and imagery to convey a sense of isolation and to echo the sadness of the disabled soldier. So in the first line, there's a semantic field of inactivity, passivity and helplessness. The soldier is sitting, He's in a wheeled chair and he's waiting, which in its sense is a state of inactivity, waiting for dark. So we can already see a sense in which there's an ongoing suffering here shown in the participle verb form. Now the use of dark is one to have a think about here. Why is the soldier waiting for dark? Is it that the dark offers some kind of release or some possibility of escape as he goes into sleep? Or is it uh, a sense that the soldier is ashamed of his body now and is waiting for dark to hide that ruined form? Or is it simply that the darkness here represents death and there's nothing else for the soldier to wait for other than death? Either way, the darkness is very disturbing here, very harrowing for the soldier who shivered in his ghastly suit of grey now you'll notice the sibilant sounds here on shivered and ghastly and suit, which kind of create a whispering, secretive feel, almost as if the soldier is ashamed, perhaps again of his body or his deformity or his current situation. The, the word ghastly is an interesting one as well, in that the soldier is ghastly in both appearance, obviously the ghastly suit of grey and the wheeled chair, are not things that he's proud of or used to, but also a sense in which he's ghastly in spirits, which implies a ghost-like existence or a 
living death, and that's picked up on in the colour palette of grey, often contrasted with red later on, and grey suggests he is indeed a shadow of his former self. Suddenly then we get legless, sewn short at elbow, and now we realise why the suit is ghastly, and this brutal, harsh, shocking close-up of the soldier's injury is foregrounded through delay, as the enjambement doesn't reveal the extent of the soldier's injury until 9-3. So it's now that we realise why that suit is so ghastly, because it's legless, because it's sewn short at the elbow, and we realise that the soldier has lost both legs and an arm. So that in itself is a harrowing, shocking image for the reader. And of course now we have the juxtaposition of the voices of boys ring saddening like a hymn, voices of play and pleasure after day. And this juxtaposition, and sorry this bit should be purple, I'm not sure why it's uh, red here, but this juxtaposition of the carefree children evokes terrible sadness in the soldier through contrast and presumably you know this is a man who himself was used to play and pleasure and we very much see that in stanza two the soldier was very much a man who lived life to its its fullest and these sounds of innocent laughter must be torturous to the soldier waiting waiting for death waiting for dark waiting for sleep waiting for some kind of salvation that presumably isn't isn't coming and of course we recognise that play and pleasure are no longer available to the soldier. And the final line again is, 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 a, is a worrying one. Till gathering sleep had mothered them from him. And what I want to focus on here is the word mothered, which suggests the soldier's childlike status now, that he too needs mothering. And you can see at this point just how emasculated the soldier is, or how feminised the soldier has become, that he's very much lost his autonomy and is very much dependent on others. Um, as we see in the last stanza, the final stanza, dependent on others even to put him to sleep. And what Owen creates here is a relationship based on pity and an exclusive attention to the soldier's physical impairment. And this is what has been criticised about Wilfred Owen's portrayal of disability, that he focuses exclusively on the physical impairment and a sense of loss. He doesn't really focus on things beyond the body, about how the mind has an extraordinary ability to regenerate and renew itself and find meaningful uh, fulfilment in other things. But that's something we'll come on to look at in the, the last slide. So let's have a quick look at stanza two then. Now, stanza two offers a really romanticised glimpse into the soldier's past, and this is coupled with a huge sense of loss and change which has been brought about by his injuries, and perhaps even more po poignantly by the soldier's own awareness that he himself has contributed to this by his folly. So the blue section then, about this time town used to swing so gay, um, is a transition to a, a sort of enchanted past. And you'll see that the language is very warm, very magical in quality, that the language is quite soft. So we have the glow lamps budding, the light blue trees, so some synesthesia there. And it's a very romantic lexical field. And we see that the soldier's past life was full of girls and beauty and promise. And those things are forever lost to the soldier now, of course. Um, and that's very harrowing in the old times, before he threw away his knees. And that line in red, that metaphor of waste, implies blame. Um, and the folly and naivety of the soldier is stressed by this verb through, before he threw away his knees, which suggests a carelessness on his part, a complicity almost. And now we transition into the green, and again, this bit should be green. I'm not sure why it's come out red, so apologies there. Now he will never feel again how slim girls' waists are, or how warm their subtle hands. And this abrupt switch to present tense, the now um, and never, emphasise the soldier's new reality. He will never again feel, Owen implies, how slim girls' waists are. 
And here, of course, we see this total transformation in women and girls' attitudes towards the soldier in his new body. He's socially and sexually ostracised, and that's emphasised by the word never, which underlines the absoluteness of his position. And what's important here, and of course it's echoed in these key words in purple here, the supple hands and the queer disease, Owen is hinting at a slyness in the women's behaviour and presenting a kind of betrayal of the soldier who is not only ignored by the women, but uh, emasculated by them too. Um, perhaps the word queer could hint at this loss of heterosexual contact and in a kind of enforced celibacy of the soldier's life now that he is so profoundly damaged physically. And I think what Owen is hinting at here is a kind of social displacement and that's emphasised by his choice of the word disease. So the soldier becomes almost like a leper and he's marginalised and peripheralised and very much excluded socially from, from a meaningful participation in the world. And I think that's what's so important about this poem, that the young men who are prepared to sacrifice their lives, and this soldier who certainly sacrificed his body um, for his country, is now simply rendered um, invalid and, and almost thrown away by society, or certainly marginalised and peripheralised and, and put into the corner of society where he won't be so, such a burden, he won't be so difficult to look at. And I think there we certainly see a criticism of how disability, certainly at that time of writing, was treated by society. Okay, so let's move on to stanza three. Now, the third stanza again deals with the soldier's past self and with his youth and physical attractiveness and shows how these have been wasted in war. So we start on the blue section with an artist, silly for his face, for it was younger than his youth last year. And the implication here is that the soldier has posed perhaps for some war propaganda, perhaps for some kind of poster, and has been deliberately selected for his youth and beauty. Um, and the idea is that his youth and beauty is even younger than the youth that was chosen to represent the face of war last year. So again, we have a sense of juxtaposition between past and present, as we saw in stanza one. The opening focuses on this highly prized youth and beauty, both stolen by war. And of course, we have resonance of propaganda and images that the soldier might have posed for. And here, of course, there is an implied criticism of the government who encouraged, actively encouraged underage boys to enlist and indeed have promoted this particular soldier. Now, the phrase last year is conspicuously placed at the end of the line. Just one year has passed in this young man's life, but his lifespan has halved. We see that here, half his lifetime lapsed in the hot race. And now he has a body and mind aged by suffering and by experience. So in part, this poem traces a journey from innocence to experience. And certainly by the time we get to the end of the poem, the soldier is ruined by experience. Now, of course, he is old. His back will never brace. And we see Owen returning to particular motifs, particular ideas. Here we have the word now, again, this abrupt bringing us back into the present reality of the soldier. And also the idea of never, which has been used previously, his back will never brace. And this again implies the absoluteness of his new state of being. In the red section, he's lost his colour very far from here, poured it down shell holes till veins run dry. The use of the personal pronoun he's lost suggests blame, it suggests a deliberate action on the soldier's part, as does the verb poured, poured it down shell holes till the veins ran dry, which almost renders the young man complicit in his own ruin. And of course here Owen is, is preempting his impulsive determination to enlist, which we see in the next stanza. But nonetheless, there is certainly a sense in which the soldier is complicit in his own ruin here. Half his lapse, lifetime has lapsed in the hot race. And again, that word hot race is important. Is this how the young man perceived war like a game? And again, we can link here to Pope 
and the jingoists and in particular pope's poem um the game which presents war as as almost a cricket match or a football match with crowds cheering from the stands and players running around on the field as though it's something quite joyous and quite celebratory and of course trivializes the horrendous injury and horrendous experience of war itself and leap of purple spurted from his thigh now the verbs leap here and spurted might sound hyperbolic but we do have to remember that the injury was severe enough to cause the amputation of both the soldier's legs so i think that's quite uh, an important sense of the enormous injury sustained on the battlefield and you'll notice here just as a final point all these different l sounds lost and shell holes till half lifetime lapsed and leap this is a liquid alliteration which we've seen before when we did the presentation on dolce et decorum est this liquid alliteration creates a flow of movement like liquid and of course this is referring to the blood pouring out and leaping spurting out from his thigh. So there's a lot of verbs of movement here, and this emphasized by the liquid alliteration. Okay, so let's just move on to the next stanza, stanza four. Now this is the longest of the six stanzas. And in this stanza, Owen analyzes the soldier's motives for enlisting and subsequently reveals that he joined for all the wrong reasons, for female attention, for vanity, for Horatian notions of honour and glory and romance, for female attention, but interestingly, no moral or conscientious reasons. So we start with the section in blue, and we very much here see a semantic field of sportsmanship and masculinity. Exhilarated with alcohol and success, the soldier saw that the manly thing to do was enlist. And this is quite a machismo section, you see all the men together after football, very drunk, being carried soldier high, you know, kind of triumphant with his injury, perhaps man of the match. And you see that the soldier thought he'd better join. And his reasons seem to be based really here on ego. And you see the caesura here, just before the phrase, he wonders why. And this pause for thought, of course, brings up the soldier's own sense of self-doubt and recrimination and regret now as he looks back and wonders why he was so eager to enlist and throw his life away. And of course, the soldier supplies the answer himself here. Someone had said he'd look a god in kilts, that's why, and maybe too to please his Meg. Aye, that was it, to please the giddy jilts. So you see how the young man was driven by vanity and a desire for female attention. Giddy jilts here are women, it suggests that they're foolish or silly or fickle. And again, I think it's important to notice how women are presented in, in a negative way, um, as flighty, as uh, inconsistent, as insincere. And Owen's tone towards them, <coughs> excuse me, becomes increasingly bitter and vehement as the poem goes on. And Owen's next criticism is towards military officials who exploit the soldier's impulsivity and naivety, as indeed he criticizes this in Dolce et Decorum S. He asked to join, he didn't have to beg. Smilingly, they wrote his lie, aged 19 years. And you can see here how the soldier has enlisted before the legal age of consent. And very much aware of this, the government have still written his age down, written his age down as a lie, and eagerly encouraged him to enlist. Germans, he scarcely thought of, all their guilt and Austria's did not move him, and no fears of fear came yet. And this section just serves to stress the soldier's moral and political ignorance. He has no idea of why he is enlisting. He certainly has no political reasons for enlisting. Fear, of course, is capitalised as an unexperienced force. The soldier is young, he's childlike, he's naive. He has no awareness of the fear of battle yet. Why would he? So much was censored. And of course, the idea is that he's been brainwashed by the jingoists and the Horatian ideals of the glamour and glory and honour of war. The final section then really just presents the trappings of military life that again have persuaded the soldier to enlist. So 
the jeweled hilts, daggers in plaid socks, smart salutes, and so on. And you can see that he's been driven by propaganda and pageantry and pomp and ceremony, the camaraderie of the, the brotherly nature of war. And even financially, he's motivated by promise of pay arrears and housing and other things that were promised to these young men. And this very much list-like nature again echoes his childlike sentiments. You know, he, ha he has been persuaded by the propaganda. It very much has worked on him. OK, so let's have a look at stanza five. Now, Owen's purpose in this stanza is to highlight that those who return from war are pitied for their injury, as opposed to being venerated for their sacrifice. And the main thing to think about is how the crowds cheer soldiers off, so much pomp and circumstance and ceremony and so much sound and fury. And yet when soldiers return, um, they very much return to silence almost, or certainly this soldier does. We're told that some cheer him home, but not as crowds cheer goal, and only a solemn man who brought him fruits thanked him and inquired about his soul. So the idea of the soldier returning to such silence with no girls, no women, no fellow sportsmen, no brother soldiers to greet him, makes his return seem almost secretive, almost shameful. And indeed, there has been some discussion about um, the damaged veterans almost being taken off quickly before anyone could see the extent of their injuries and hence be put off enlisting for war themselves. So again, there's very much a sense of an absence of glory, an absence of triumph. In fact, the only thing present is the solemn man who thanks him. And I think the idea of thanking him being in italics is to show how meaningless these thanks are now to the soldier. Um, and of course, the fact that he's given the fruit, which is the traditional gift of the invalid, just shows how different his life has become now. So it's almost a, a symbol, an image of his invalidity to society, um, to the community. And of course, he's asked about his soul because his body is already gone. Only death and the release it promises beckons. So there's a sense in which the man who visits him inquires whether his soul is ready for death. Is it perhaps laden with guilt or sin? And that's something we'll explore in previous, in, sorry, in subsequent poems. So the final stanza then, and one which I think is perhaps the most harrowing of them all, focuses on the soldier's future, which offers only a few sick years in institutes. And the implication is very much that this young man has accepted society's assessment of his value or lack of value, and has resigned himself to the life of an invalid without any kind of a fight. Now he will spend a few sick years in institutes and do what things the rules consider wise and take whatever pity they may dole. And there's such a reluctance in that word dole as though the government are dealing out their pity um, in a mean way. The word institutes is also a really cold and clinical word. And I think there's a real sense of criticism here for the lack of meaningful care and rehabilitation for war veterans, particularly at that time. But of course, this is still very much a problem in society today. There is no compassion for the soldier. There's no sense in which people care about his rehabilitation. And instead, he's kind of, as we said before, marginalized, peripheralized in an institute on the borders of society where he'll no longer have an active or meaningful purpose. His autonomy is gone. And he's totally dependent on others and not just an invalid, but deemed invalid as though he has no role now. He has no purpose. In fact, he's just a burden on the state and must accept whatever charity is offered. So that's the first criticism. The second is of the women. And Owen returns again to this idea that the women are more interested in the ideal soldier, the ideal body, rather than the reality. So this is, of course, a Horatian notion of the strong, fit, proud, determined, stoic soldier. Um, and that's the ideal that is romanticized by women and adored by women. And of course, this young man who once was adored, who once was highly attractive to women, is now overlooked by women who have eyes only for the strong men, 
who were whole. So again, there's a body politic of sorts going on here in that men who are unwhole, men who have lost limbs or have been rendered uh, incapacitated by war, are somehow invalid. They are they're desexualized, emasculated. And the irony, of course, here is that the soldier himself still has sexual desires. He's only 18 or 19 years old and he notices, and that's where I think we see the pity. He notices how the women's eyes pass from him to the strong men that are whole. And that, that's painful for this young man. And then we have the very harrowing final lines. How cold and late it is. Why don't they come and put him to bed? Why don't they come? And the passivity of the soldier's life is really emphasised here by the fact that he can't even put himself to bed. And this is coupled with the irony of being reliant on women to put him to bed, when in his previous life he perhaps could have expected to take them to bed. So these final questions are really pitiful and really pleading, and his abandonment suggests even the nurses are disinterested in him and are uh, perhaps disgusted with him. And that reinforces his own sense of alienation and estrangement. This is a man who can no longer, or so we're told, is no longer worthy of meaningful relationships, no longer worthy of meaningful work, no longer worthy of a meaningful place within society. So that's really interesting. Um, the final quick comment I have on here is from Dominic Hibbard, who questions... Um, who, who suggests that the questions are linked to the recruiting poster of 1914, which asked in response to the, of the soldiers, will they never come? In the sense of requesting for more soldiers to come and aid in the war. And of course, there's the irony there in that the soldier who did come, who did go to assist, is now himself invalided out of war and is himself asking, why don't they come? Why don't they come? So there's a kind of poignant mirroring of the propaganda and the actual reality of the soldier's life. OK, so finally, then, I just want to move on to a couple of thoughts to think about as we end this presentation. So there are two main critical opinions of this poem. The first is in high praise of the poem, it suggests Owen is at his most compassionate. He's at his most intimate in this really close up exploration of the plight of the ruined man and as I mentioned earlier this is really unusual for Owen to zoom in and focus really in quite a close way at the small detail of a single individual as Owen normally looks at the soldiers as a group where of course Owen could be more critical and of course he does hint towards the soldier's own folly his own foolishness in impulsively signing up for war before he was even of legal age ultimately it's Owen's compassion and sympathy that rises through at the end um, as he presents the past and present and future lives of this, this terribly damaged soldier. The second opinion of the poem is more critical and makes the point that Owen presents a very one-dimensional portrayal of, the di of disability. So this idea is that Owen presents the soldier only as a spectacle or object of pity rather than seeing him as heroic or triumphant in what he's done for his country. So these critics argue that this particular depiction of disability, which of course is very negative and presents the soldier as waiting for death, this particular depiction overlooks a desire to survive and create a meaningful life and go on to conduct meaningful relationships with a less, perf less than perfect body and these critics suggest that it is Owen, rather than society, who focuses on the physical body and focuses on the loss of wholeness of the physical body to be demeaning and uh, disabling of the man. Um, and the, the idea is, of course, that many disabled people live extremely fulfilling and productive and worthy lives. So that's kind of the second idea that perhaps Owen is, is only zooming in and presenting a very negative opinion of disability. Anyway, I think I'll leave it there for now. So thank you very much for listening and hopefully you'll tune in for the next presentation. Thank you.